welcome John Nichols and Bill DeGrees. is so coordinated that I just learned five minutes ago that I am to give the introduction for Bill <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And so... Nobody can do them better than you, John. There you go. See, it, it was a foregone conclusion. And fortunately, I scribbled a few notes before I came here. And so I want to give a little rundown of Bill's uh, oeuvre. O-E-U-V-R-E. -E. And, um, and first of all, I'd like to say one of his greatest books is called The River of Traps, and uh, where all of us who live in northern New Mexico can learn the most uh, precious uh, rules of how to survive up here. And that book will teach you that you must always steal your irrigation water from your neighbor's ditch <laughs> and be sure to carry a pistol while you do it. <laughs> uh, Bill's next book is called Enchantment and Exploitation, which is about the uh, history of northern New Mexico, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And it's a great book about Armageddon in northern New Mexico. <laughs> and the next book, Salt Dreams, uh, which deals uh, with California water problems, the salt and sea, etc., uh, with beautiful photography, is a great book about water Armageddon in Southern California. <laughs> and another of his books, A Great Aridness, is one of the best books ever written about Armageddon in the entire Southwest. <laughs> and one of Bill's personal essays, probably one of his, his most personal essays, is called The Walk. And it's a really great book about the Armageddon <laughs> of raising and slaughtering your own horses in northern New Mexico. And Bill's last book, most recently published book, is called The Last Unicorn, which is one of the greatest books that I have ever read about Armageddon <laughs> in the jungles of Laos and along the Vietnamese border. And uh, despite this wise guy introduction, I need to say that Bill is one of the one of our areas and our nation's best and most influential writers who tells it like it is with a remarkable social conscience and uh, for the last unicorn, uh, Bill's most recent book, um, I want to read some excerpts from a letter that I wrote to him after I read this book about searching for the nearly extinct Saola uh, an animal, kind of antelope, kind of animal that lives in the jungles uh, of, of Laos. And um, so here's my letter I wrote it on March 31st about the last unicorn. Dear Bill, word has it you're back in New Mexico at least for a spell. The last unicorn is amazing. Many thanks for sending a copy. I've also got a hardcover. I just finished the book and really liked Ali McGraw's blurb on the back. It's incredibly researched, truly poetic, and a heart-wrenching wake-up call. It's also exhausting. My God, I felt I was tromping along with you guys through the fucking jungle every foot of the slippery human way. Deserts I can deal with. Jungles scare me witless. Humidity scares me witless. Heat drives me insane. You've got moxie. It's a wonderful book. I don't know how you manage to meld everything back and forth, in and out, off on this tangent or that. History, smuggling, turtle blood, aphrodisiacs, U.S. bombs in the ground making the landscape evil and yet keeping on track every step of the way on this indelible portrait of a place, a people, and the last unicorn. How do you save a ghost if you're not even sure it exists? Who's leading, someone in his group asked. The blind, 
the leader of the group, Robichaud, says. <laughs> Robichaud, who is the leader of this expedition to try and find a soul, is incredible. Your tale of the snares in the jungle is so disheartening. Vlad the Impaler, indeed. In fact, the entire book is really disheartening and also very beautiful. It's cool. You brought in Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald's test of a first-rate intelligence. The question I get asked most after I give one of my diatribes is how do you have hope? Where do you find optimism? The ugliness of the end game. We will eat anything with four legs except the table. The utter absence of sympathy for wild creatures in your book is amazing. And so we human beings perish from our appetites. I like your humor throughout. Roby shows humor also. I really got a chortle when he's kicking you under the table to just shut the fuck up when you're trying to convince environmental people to up their game. The best description of all is your quote, successive paroxysms of ejection, such as you never experience, this is vomiting, fearing burst arteries or broken ribs with every orifice taking part, except that my brains did not come out of my ears. This is when Bill got sick, marching through the jungle there. Two of the loveliest pages in your book are page 245 and 246. That what gets Roby Show, the leader of the expedition, out of his sleeping bag in the morning is beauty. Beauty moves the heart as reason moves the mind, he says. And later he talks about a loneliness that would spread to infinity if we lose the last unicorn and other animals and vegetation and everything else uh, that's going extinct. Finally, at the end of my letter, I said, your book tells us, so we bear witness and we grieve and we love being here even though we cannot stay. It's quite a story of Robichaud being bitten at one time in the eyeball by an ant. I think this book is like us being bitten in the eyeball by an ant. It was exciting at the end to see a remote camera that took a picture of a saoba. So anyway, I'm just rattling on. Last Saturday, M. Hall and Beth Haddis, who are friends of Bill and mine, came up for a visit to Taos, and we climbed up the South Boundary Trail at the mouth of Taos Canyon. Much of the way, Beth Haddis and I talked about the last unicorn because we were both at about the same place in your book and had fun regaling each other with all your adventures and with the sheer inexhaustible power of the book. It seemed synchronistic that we were almost on the same page of the book, three quarters done, and both of us were loving it. So many, many thanks, more than I can say. And believe me, I'm breathing in. Cheers. And now, Bill DeBuise. Need I say that um, that letter John wrote was the best letter <laughs> about a book that I have received in my entire life. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from The Last Unicorn, uh, but first with thanks to John and Jan, where have you gone? There you are. Somos, great institution. It's so nice to be here in Taos and here at the Harwood, another great institution. I remember when I was working on enchantment and exploitation, I would come up here from El Valle and spend whole days 
holed up in what was then the Harwood Library, looking at old junk that was there that was infinitely fascinating to me. So John has told you a little bit about this book. Um, it is the account of a uh, wildlife expedition in Laos, central Laos, in a place called Nakainam Tun National Protected Area, sometimes abbreviated just NNT. And we were looking for a saula, which is um, a very rare animal. There may be dozens left on the planet. There may be, uh, if we're really lucky, a couple of hundred. It's a beautiful animal with a very serene disposition. It looks, it's about the size of a carousel pony, and it has long, almost straight, uh, tapered horns. And when it turns sideways, then in, in perspective, those two horns merge into one, and it looks like a unicorn. And some people call it the Asian unicorn. And it's as rare as a unicorn. <coughs> this is a kind of spoiler alert, but we didn't see one uh, on the trip. Uh, we know that from medieval lore, back in, let's say, 1280, when uh, the carpenters were nailing the roof on Chartres Cathedral, everybody knew that to see a unicorn, you had to be absolutely, impeccably pure of heart. So. Transferring that idea to the present and the salon, Robichaud and I knew we were disqualified. <laughs> so anyhow, we're in the we're in deep forest. We're in an area where uh, blue eyes have never previously uh, seen this watershed we're in. It's called the Nam Yong watershed, and. Uh, our expedition is 14 people. There are only two Westerners, Robichaud and me, a couple of Lao University students, a Lao administrator for the WMPA, the Watershed Management and Protection uh, Authority, which manages, or in theory, manages NNT. And then we have nine SEC and BREW uh, porters and guides. And SEC and BREW are two ethnic groups present in NNT. About 5,000 people live within the uh, protected area. And uh, they're really not Lao. They speak Sek or Bru as a first language. Uh, we used to call them tribal, hill tribes. Uh, nowadays they're called ethnic minorities. Take your pick. And uh, on this particular day, uh, from the, the passage I'm about to read, uh, Robichaud and I are looking going up uh, a side stream of the Nam Yang, looking for Saula sign, and the one uh, guide with us is Paivan, who is carrying a, uh, an AK-47. We had three armed militiamen on the expedition, so he's, he's along with us for security in case we run into any Vietnamese poachers. And the Vietnamese poachers are the big problem there, and they build snare lines, sometimes a kilometer or a kilometer and a half long, which are hedges of brush, and every three meters or so there'll be a gap, and in each gap there's a foot snare with a spring pole. That you step on that, and you, you go. So anyhow, I hope this will make sense to you. Here's the setup, and a little bit about Paivon. While Robichaud and I go up the creek bed, Paivon, wearing his Statue of Liberty t-shirt, will flank us, checking the canyon side on the left for snares. I watch him go. His feet clad in flip-flops. I doubt he has worn a shoe in his life. He ascends the sheer slope, each step with equal strength, each foot placed exactly, always in balance, always with the same poised ease whether moving forward or stepping back to avoid an obstacle. Walking and carrying loads are among the most mundane activities in life, but some people are better at them than others. The Sek and other residents of Nakai Nam Tun acquired wheeled vehicles only a few years ago when hand tractors and motorbikes arrived. And while they have long harnessed water buffalo to plow their paddies, they have never used pack animals. Every kilo of rice harvested from their mountain swiddens is carried homeward on their backs. 
The same may be said for every house post and bundle of thatch, at least until recently. From a young age, someone like Taiwan would have walked miles every day in the forest, often bearing heavy loads. His ingrained skills are marvelous to behold. I can no more duplicate his grace in this terrain than I might match a Puebloan cliff dweller on the scarps of Mesa Verde. So I'm going to skip a little bit and resume here, a little farther down the page. We're sitting. Robichaud's gone up the, the watershed to look for signs. It's getting the climbing, it's, it's uh, ledge, ledge and drop in reverse. So we're climbing up waterfalls. And at a certain point, uh, it becomes hopeless for me. We're like mice on a staircase going like that. But Robichaud can scale these things much better than I am. So he's gone forward. A slow rain of leaves trickles from the canopy. A barbet chants, Tukaru. The forest vibrates with an insect clatter that is like the rattle and whir of a chain link assembly line, as though an infinitude of gadgets were being manufactured. And indeed they are. Stems, beetles, grubs, leaves, centipedes, eggs, nymphs, molds, turds, photosynthesized sugars, microstomatic exhalations of oxygen, and 10,000 things more. The eco-factory is running full bore. Paivan and I exchange smiles, which in the absence of a common language is about all we have the capacity to share. I wonder about his prospects. He is a subsistence farmer, a quantum guide, and a militiaman. He can stay in his village or he can emigrate to Nakai or the poorer quarters of Yantian. He is a good-hearted and capable fellow, and if he weren't look, working for us, he might as easily work in illegal logging, the wildlife trade, or rosewood smuggling. He likely has dabbled in one or all of these areas already. There are surely other alternatives unknown to me, but not many. At this moment, Paivan is the master of an AK-47 and a 15-bullet clip. He cleans the surface of his weapon with a corner of his shirt and a spit-moistened twig, which he has chewed into a kind of brush. He picks out grime from the rifle's deepest, deepest crevices with the weirdly long nail of his little finger, which, like many of his countrymen, he cultivates for deep and satisfying scratching of the inner ear. <laughs> So I'm going to jump forward a little bit more and bring you into this story, still same day, same situation. At the top of the slope, the snare line we have been following crests the ridge and continues down the other side. No animal traveling the ridge can fail to encounter it. Robichaud and I pause at one sprung trap to examine a snared silver pheasant a male in glorious plumage, its feathers a speckled snowfall beneath the corpse. Paivan starts down the other side, still following the line, collecting every wire noose. Soon he calls to us with urgency. He stands beside a red-shanked duke, also called Duke Langer, snared by one foot, hanging upside down. The limp hands, it's a monkey, the limp hands reach vainly for the untouchable earth. The monkey has been dead for several days, possibly longer. Scavengers have torn away the fur and eaten one leg to the bone. <coughs> like Saula, red shank dukes are endemic to the Anamite Mountains and adjacent lowlands. Dukes range much of the length of the mountain change, exhibiting intriguing but poorly understood color variation black, gray, and red-shanked forms from south to north. The adaptable rhesus macaque may travel the world in cages and inhabit many a zoo and testing laboratory, but maintaining a duke separate from its habitat requires competence that few institutions possess, so not many are found in captivity. Nevertheless, fashion designers should note that few creatures in nature and certainly no other primates dress with more flair. The basic suit of the duke is gray flannel with a cape of black. 
Among the red shank, the trouser legs are the color of Williamsburg brick. The fingers are black, but the hands and forearms are white, an elegant touch giving the appearance of long, fingerless gloves. The tail and rump are cream-colored, and the pretty, snub-nosed face, framed by a white beard and black headband, <coughs> is mango orange, the color of a dessert. Dukes are leaf-eaters and lead all, an almost entirely arboreal life. The carcass in the snare of a forest testifies to the peril of a visit to the ground. The spring pole of the trap that killed the duke is thick, powerful, and tall. And when the monkey stepped into the snare, it must have whipped him into the air as though he were a minnow jigged on a salmon <coughs> line. If he was lucky, his spine gave way and the snap killed him, but this was probably not the case. There are few vertebrates more supple than a duke, which even by the standards of monkeydom is lank and long-limbed and moves as though made of rubber. Probably the animal bobbed at the end of the wire for a long while and kept bobbing as he clawed at the metal tourniquet that is, had seized his ankle. His shrieks would have caused the rest of his tribe to draw near. Perhaps they gathered in the trees above, chattering anxiously, faces contorted with worry. One or two might have come down and gingerly touched the victim, trying to understand his plaint or even comfort him. Perhaps they too picked at the wire. I wonder if at some point the Duke managed to right himself and perch atop the spring pole to which he was tethered. The maneuver would have required spectacular athleticism, but once the animal's panic subsided to a dull roar, maybe it was possible. Balancing on an unsteady stick, however, would have been expensive in energy and concentration. Eventually, the tribe moved away to feed or sleep for the night, and unquiet darkness fell. Pain, exhaustion, and sleeplessness then took their toll. Fear was constant. The moment had to come when the duke could no longer hold on, and he toppled from his perch to hang inverted, gravity working his heart and veins the wrong way, the legs drained, the head gorged. Slowly, too slowly, dehydration and hunger eroded consciousness and pulse, a torture like the martyrdom of a saint at the hands of especially creative centurions. Rubbish was cursing, stamping around, visibly moved. He's not distraught exactly, but he has acquired a molar grinding intensity. He retrieves a tiny video camera from his pack and records the scene, narrating the ghoulish details. Particularly sad, a Duke Langer, listed on the IUCN red list, is globally endangered, usually arboreal. This one came to the ground for something and was caught in the snare and hung here until it died. Ivan has found a scrap of trash nearby. It's an empty package boasting menthol candy, candy. A few words are printed in English, but most of the lettering is Vietnamese. The brand is, the brand is Hanoi Capital. We are days of travel from the nearest village, much too far for local hunters to have come to set snares. And if any questions remained about the Vietnamese origin of the men who built and then abandoned the snare, this bag is a kind of signature. We take pictures of the duke while Paivan prevents it from spinning. Robichaud is now silent. His narration and picture-taking finished, he has plunged deep into himself. Abruptly, he stows the recorder in his pack and heads downhill, moving fast. But it doesn't seem right to leave. The duke, a cousin primate, is still dangling. Should we not cut him down? but I have nothing to cut the wire with, and the spring pole is long, the junction of wire and pole too high to reach. Paivon is watching me the way a border collie watches a pro problematic sheep. He won't, will not leave until I do, although he would certainly like to get going, get on with things, gather the rest of the snares, and finish our patrol. I try to remember the Lao word for machete, thinking we could hack down the spring pole, but I cannot summon it. Besides, I don't think Paivan is carrying anything but his Kalashnikov. I'm at a loss, 
also tired and hungry, an observer without tools. I take a last look at the Duke and glumly follow Robichaud down the slope. Our failure to cut down the Duke nags at me. It nags at me still, although I had no idea what I would have done with him once I had him on the ground. Just stretch him out and leave him? Perch him in the fork of a tree? Take him away and hide him so that anyone returning to check the snares would get no benefit from his skull or hands or genitals? if he still had them. Our small party is silent on the descent to the next creek and thence to the river, but my mind is churning. Mentally, I compose an imagined letter which grows into a report. Even as I hop boulders and dodge holdfast vines, I'm cobbling together and trying to hold in my memory the sentences and paragraphs, then whole pages calculated to alarm the international, environmental, and social panel of experts, the independent monitoring agency, the managers of the WMPA, the World Bank, and the readers of the New York Times. I lay out the gravity of the cruel world war on wildlife being waged in the Kainan Tun, and the extreme and poignant threat it poses to one of the richest concentrations of biodiversity on the planet. I persuade myself that if I set out the facts accurately and eloquently, infuse the argument with vigor, and build it step by an ex inexorable step, the decision makers will finally and meaningfully take action. I see matters in sharp definition. The sequence of points to be made, the multiple elements comprising a solution, the ultimate benefits of a secure, well-patrolled, protected area. I feel saturated with ideas. Then we reach the river. We pause by the murmuring water. The air feels soft. The shadows cool and long. We rest, drinking deeply from our canteens. Gradually, cooling and rehydrating, I remember how the world works. I'm going to read one more short, uh, short passage, just uh, not even two pages. Um, and this is uh, uh, a passage that uh, John referred to uh, earlier. It's, it's page 244 and 245. <laughs> um, and I just kept thinking during your introduction, uh, John, as, as you were talking about my previous book, said uh, the, only, the only appropriate answer to your characterization of things is to say, Armageddon out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> okay, so here's the, here's the final um, passage here. Some conservationists argue for the preservation of places like MNT on the basis of the value of biodiversity. They maintain, for instance, that the chemistry of Earth's biota may hold the key to new chemicals or cures for disease. There's truth enough in this, as many studies make clear the story of Taxol, derived from yew bark and effective in treating breast cancer, is one of them. But such breakthroughs are episodic and unpredictable. They make a frail foundation for a muscular ethic of protection. Another stronger utilitarian argument centers on environmental services, the prevention of erosion, moderation of climate, purification of water, and other benefits that healthy ecosystems provide. The society that drains its wetlands or levels its forests soon finds that it must pay handsomely to replace the flood protection or water yield it formerly received for free. Or more commonly, it learns to scrape by in a degraded, more miserable, and more hazardous world. All true. But a forest does not have to contain tigers and saula in order to fulfill its vital hydrological functions. And a wetland need not harbor a white-winged duck in order to modify a storm surge. There are other functions, pollination being one, that more clearly rest upon a foundation of diversity, but the arguments that make the case for ecological complexity 
notwithstanding the wonders they recount, put the rank and file of humankind to sleep. A defense of the intricacy of the web of life demands another banner. Some religionists will say that God's creation is a sacred thing and must not be diminished. By this reckoning, thou shalt not kill, an injunction common to all great religions, might be thought to apply to the protection of species, too. But the contrary view, voiced loudly in certain corners of Christianity, but known as well from other monotheisms, is at least as widespread, namely that God put man at the center of creation, giving him dominion over all else, so that if a species flickers out, it is his will. Unfortunately, God has remained lamentably silent on the subject and appears unwilling to break the tie. If you probe deep enough among the people who labor in the domain of species protection, you find another answer, another motivation. It goes by many names and it often goes unmentioned, ceding primacy in formal publications to the usual quasi-economic analyses of costs and benefits, or to the unprovable umbrella argument that small tears in the fabric of light will lead to big rents that endanger humankind. Robichaud, like many others, says that what gets him out of his sleeping bag in the morning is something different and simpler. It's beauty. No matter how it is parsed or how much it resides in the eye of the beholder, no matter how its elements might be divided among delight, awe, surprise, or inspiration, Beauty moves the heart as reason moves the mind. Imagine a world deprived of the tanager's colors, of the hummingbird's whir, of the mad shrieks of a rookery of seabirds. Imagine the Arctic without its fearsome white bear, Bengal without its tiger, the Serengeti without its prides of lions, pride being an ancient and meaningful term. We are entranced by beautiful creatures, not just because they give pleasure and inspire awe, but because they carry a charge, like an ionized particle. Beauty excites and glows. Put a horse in an empty meadow, and the meadow becomes animate. Put a saula, even a saula you cannot see, in a forest, and the forest, as though it held a unicorn, acquires an energy that cannot, cannot be named. It becomes numinous. It gains the pull of gravity, the weight of water, the float of a feather. introduce this uh, irresponsible character who was up here previous to me, and uh, I have some things to say. <laughs> I was on a program with John uh, back in 2013, and it's not, it wasn't an event where you uh, would ordinarily have expected to find him. We were both speaking at the 100th year anniversary celebration of the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists. <laughs> the fish squeezers and the snake charmers. I kid you not. We were scheduled on separate days, and I went first. I gave a depressing talk about climate change, but people seemed to like it. It turns out that a lot of people like to be depressed. So I felt pretty good about that. John spoke the next day giving what he called a rambling peroration, which wasn't rambling at all. I later read it. About his grandfather and him and their love of nature. His grandfather, you see, 
was John Treadwell Nichols, the dean of American fish squeezers and a longtime fixture at the American Museum of Natural History, who had founded the society a century earlier. I wasn't there to hear John speak, but before long, one of the organizers called me to discuss something. And in the conversation, he mentioned, he said, Bill, you did a fine job. We really appreciate it. But you should have heard John Nichols. <laughs> this friend of ours, uh, who I was talking to, a guy named Steve Platania, was obviously still glowing from John's talk. He said it was wickedly funny, full of personal anecdote and individual character, casual in delivery, brilliantly informed, and shaped into a seamlessly crafted, heartfelt, sometimes self-mocking, sometimes irreverent story. He said it was a wonderful journey for everybody in the audience. You might have said it was a lot like a John Nichols novel, 12 or 13 of which have now been published, and God knows how many more of them a lie waiting to be freed from the truckloads of John's papers now archived at the library of the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Uh, John, by the way, has also written a nonfiction book, books. But nobody describes John as well as John does. <laughs> so I'm going to read to you a couple of paragraphs uh, from his website, which have a uh, kind of distinctly uh, Nichols flavor. He writes, I live in northern New Mexico. I've been married and divorced three times, helped raise two kids, and survived open-heart surgery in 1994. I am not to be confused with the other John Nichols, a younger ver version who writes for the nation and other venues and publishes books like It's the Media, Stupid, and Dick, the Man Who is President. He's a great writer, and like myself, politically progressive, but he did not write An Elegy for September, Conjugal Bliss, The Magic Journey, American Blood, The Nirvana Blues, A Ghost in the Music, or The Voice of the Butterfly. I did. <laughs> if you want to run down on the novels and nonfiction books I've published, check, click the tab that says Books. <laughs> if you want to look up a bit of biographical stuff, click the tab marked Biography. If you're interested in a few critical references, click that tab. If you're an environmentalist and you think the human race can still save our planet from global warming, click the tab marked Lots of Luck. <laughs> I looked for that tab, I wanted to click it, but I <laughs> He continues. I used to be the last writer in America without a website, but obviously this is no longer the case. However, I draw the line of email and the internet. If you want to get in touch with me for any reason, you'll have to use snail mail. The address is, and then he gives his address. He continues. You better hurry, though. As of July 2012, I'm 72 years old. My heart is locked in permanent atrial fibrillation. I'm in congestive heart failure. I, I take lenoxin and carvedilol or something like that, and aspirin every day. And my doctor says I'm a walking time bomb, ready to have a stroke. So it goes. <laughs> well, so it still goes. In spite of his own intimations to the contrary, John is still going strong. Thank goodness. All qualities intact, still at it. A self-described worker bee who says he refuses to become a cynical old man, still poking a finger in the eye of pomposity and privilege with regularity, still standing up for a political vision in which all men and women and everybody else, if those first two terms aren't inclusive enough, <laughs> really are created equal. And still churning out page after page after page. He's the guy whose name completes any sentence 
that contains words like writer, finest, New Mexico, Taos, great spirit, wonderful man, John Nichols. next year, uh, emphasis on should. It's called the Annual Big Arsenic Fishing Contest, and it has absolutely no um, redeeming social value. It's about three idiots who partake in a 20-year contest on the Rio Grande River, a fishing contest, once a year every autumn. and. Um, I'm going to read you sections from the book that involve the narrator and his relationship with a woman. And the narrator is kind of like your monkey on a snare, although the snare that he's caught in is the snare of love. <laughs> wonder, wonder who wrote the snare of love. Um, <laughs> So, these are excerpts from different sections of the novel that deal with just this relationship. You'll be happy to know there are no descriptions of fishing in this section, even though 90% of the book is about fishing. So, the narrator uh, is unnamed in, in the book. His two fishing companions, one of them is called Yuri Stone, who's from New York City, and the other is called Bubba Baxter, who's from Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> but they're really not characters in what I'm going to read you. Um, so right now, this is a section that takes place on October 3rd, 1985, and my narrator is 45 years old. I came very close to losing for the first time in our third competition on October 3rd, 1985, when I snapped my rod tip 20 minutes into the afternoon and I nearly defaulted the match. That year, Bubba was only 33, Yuri, and I had celebrated 45. I was working on two screenplays. I'd recently published my fifth novel, and I just married my second wife, Rachel Ivory, a very intriguing and no-nonsense person with an IQ off the charts. We'd met over the summer in the war-torn country of Nicaragua, which was fomenting a Sandinista revolution that was being harassed by a contra-army counterinsurgency supported by Ronald Reagan's right-wing autocracy and the CIA. While on a brief film-oriented research tour there with a small group of lefties supported by a Los Angeles Jesuit council promoting liberation theology, I collided with Rachel, a journalist on assignment for NACLA. We originally came face to face crouching in a trench on the Honduran border while being debriefed by an FSLN colonel on the guerrilla war situation. I call it lust at first sight, no doubt heightened by the surrounding atmosphere of heroic revolution, leftist nation building, a pending United States invasion, and the bristling array of loaded AK-47s guarding us. Back in the USA, I visited Rachel for a week at her San Francisco apartment. Then she passed five intoxicating days with me in New Mexico. Three weeks after that, after a long-distance phone connection, I importuned her to marry me, and she said yes. 
I don't claim to have made a whole lot of rational decisions during my life, and that certainly wasn't one of them. I'm not being disingenuous here. Reason had nothing to do with our rash decision. Perhaps we tied the knot because the phone sex was great. I loved the sound of her caustic voice, and she considered my edgy sense of humor adorable. Our complimentary radical politics stroked the flames. My older daughter, Stephanie, observed, you are so out of your comfort zone, Dad. She was 16. My other daughter, Naomi, asked, am I going to have a stepmother who's younger than my sister? She was 12. Their mother, Gretchen, <laughs> their mother, Gretchen worked for a pottery barn operation in Albuquerque that featured popular hand-drawn porcelain vessels, which reproduced John Keats' immortal Gretchen urn for the gift shops of many art museums. <laughs> About Rachel, she kept mum. I mean, what good would it have availed her to kvetch about her former husband's prodigious immaturity? I'm guessing that Rachel and I fantasized marriage would be like bungee jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge lock in fevered coitus after smoking a couple of joints and dropping four tabs of purple owls. Obviously, we weren't thinking straight, but not thinking straight is an amazing turn on. It's so exciting. <laughs> Out of control, acting impulsively on a blind spontaneity of sexual excess and the untenable lunacy embraced by swearing to cohabit together forever, which may be the most cockeyed concept humanity. <laughs> Believe me, we were both enraptured by the provocative luminosity of melodrama and its total lack of self-restraint. Just writing about it propels me into an irregular heartbeat right now. <laughs> Rachel was thrice divorced, the mother of two almost grown teenage boys living in Alaska right now, gill netting salmon for competing boats. During a prior existence, she'd been a movie critic for the New Orleans Times Picayune, the manager of a San Antonio art gallery on the Riverwalk, a special ed teacher on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and a painter of diorama backgrounds at the Sam Noble Natural History Museum in Norman, Oklahoma. I know, I know. Needless to say, between marriages, there had been other men. <laughs> Rachel came with baggage, and so did I. She was five foot six with green eyes and faintly strawberry covered hair, a wiry body from working out, riding a bike, jogging, swimming at the gym, and a languid aura radiating off of her that captured me within an invisible physical embrace that is difficult to describe and was impossible to resist. She reeked of manic energy and erotic lassitude simultaneously. <laughs> I was six years older than Rachel. Bueno. Four years later, November 15th, the narrator is now 49 years old. Four years later, however, autumn of 1989, it was me crying uncle as I fled from Rachel Ivory, burned out, impotent, my tail tucked between my legs, my heart locked in angel fibrillation, my doctors getting rich. I was 49 years old, maybe fatally ill, and also fearing for my career. How could marriage be so degrading and confrontational? <laughs> Rachel had taken me out back to the woodshed and delivered a proper whooping. I don't want to delve into it, though, just for the record, I reveal that over the previous four years I'd been in an unprecedentedly volatile relationship akin to Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath, except I was the one ready to cram my head into the oven. It takes two to tango, and I have to admit I was a jerk. I should have been more open, more sympathetic, more sensitive, sadly. My problem is I have always had a bad habit of waking up when the infatuation wears off, compulsively asking myself in terror, where am I? What am I? <laughs> You know, I actually forget that baby talk BS. Just once I should summon enough courage to override my jealousy, my deflated ego, my broken heart. Rachel actually threw me 
out of the house because she deemed that I had total disregard for the sort of compassion needed to release the kind of vulnerability that is required to build true intimacy between a man and woman. There were feminist hegemony issues. You are such an uptight cat, she accused repeatedly throughout our tempestuous few years together, spent constantly at loggerheads. Why can't you understand the difference between passionate codependency and unselfish affection. I can't believe you fucked one of your ex-husbands, I shouted back at her. <laughs> it didn't mean anything, she yelled. I was just feeling bored. Love is not defined by erections. You don't own me. Then, for 20 minutes, she spewed at me invective, originally coined by Betty Friedan, Susan Brown, Miller, Angela Davis, and Shula McFarris. <laughs> But we're married, I sob, mortified. <laughs> we promise to be true. I am true, her scalding tongue insisted. True has nothing to do with genitalia. You act as if tenderness is illegal. Screwing like banshees doesn't prove anything. Lust is fun, but it's not forever. If you would honestly give yourself up to me like an adult, I would respond in kind. But I can't stand your obsessive desire for total control over me, you country bumpkin. I will not be a submissive puppy in your patriarchy. <laughs> I beseeched her not to be that way. I knew, I knew what I was losing and I couldn't bear the thought. I had become a prisoner of her typhoon. Anger is an aphrodisiac. I went down on my knees, a puling figment of my former self. The background music, power maladjustment threnody. Sex can only carry people so far, Rachel said. Then they should begin using their cerebral aptitude, and not merely to protest the SNL bailout or the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Your so-called brain, quote unquote, is still crawling through the muck of the Precambrian. It can't even breathe oxygen yet. Get out of here. Stop clinging to me. I can't stand your irrational cupidity. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> You call yourself a journalist, but you can't even handle words correctly. <laughs> Tough titty, she'd already slammed the door behind her. <laughs> Autumn of 1992, the narrator is now 52. At 52, I retained in my possession the gaily painted wooden fish trophy from Puerto Vallarta for our fishing contest with my name and the proper dates now written nine times in Sharpie ink on its big yellow tail fin for all the world to admire. I displayed that trophy fish on the kitchen wall of my new house purchased a year earlier. A prosaic 800 square foot three room adobe and cinder block hovel with a leaky dirt roof located behind the Catholic church with stumps under the floor. <laughs> Why did I buy this house? <laughs> because I had lost my former digs in an acre of irrigated land to Rachel in our divorce. <laughs> then the landlady at my two-room town rental apartment gave me the old heave-ho because I had rejected her amorous advance as a convoluted bummer that I prefer not to amplify here. <laughs> you might believe this, but of late, I had gone celibate, hoping to somehow entice Rachel back for more. I'm not sure how to explain this implausible behavior. A desperate measure, I know. What sort of tortured reasoning concludes that chastity equals seduction? Perhaps we had clashed with each other like two vandal warriors brandishing broadswords and spiked iron maces attached to the end of chains. Yet our perpetual bewildering contretemps had imbued me with a sexual delirium and emotional codependency that I know somewhere is defined as anarchical burning love, and I could not quit myself up. Of it. To be sure, the story of our big arsenic fishing contest bears no relationship to such a tyrannical abstention. Hence, I won't dwell on it here. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'd be remiss not to at least mention the problem in passing. Man does not live by fishing alone. <laughs> I found it impossible to whitewash Rachel from my mind. 
She was my Donnybrook, my Battle of the Bulge, my Dresden Firestorm. I clumped about in a broody mode, whistling melancholy dirges. Almost every weekend I casually drove by my old house, desperate to catch a glimpse of her out in the yard watering a hollyhock, or perhaps in just her bra and panties hanging freshly laundered <laughs> sheets upon the line. If, by chance, we happened to meet at the post office, I smiled at her, sickly no doubt, and Rachel nodded nodded at me coolly as we chatted about the weather and whatnot. That woman possessed demonic restraint, fiendish indifference. For one, two, three years, she'd allowed absolutely no connection to pass between us. Who knows how she accomplished that? I myself ached for her so badly. I'm surprised I did not suddenly haul off and whack her with a right uppercut in front of Uncle Sam's postal clerks and all their patrons. My older daughter Stephanie said, Give it up, old man, you're running in place and will never win the race. My younger daughter Naomi added, Pop, you should go to a proctologist and have your head examined. <laughs> inherited from guess who. Her mother, Gretchen, wisely withheld comment on my situation. There's no need for her to verbally dig my grave since I could accomplish that very well myself. Gretchen and I maintain a distant but civil relationship, all for our girls. Anyway, enough already. I purchased that cheap shack which required all my savings left after the divorce and put me in debt for the duration. Rachel, the once radical journalist, cum special ed teacher, cum museum diorama artist, had now become a successful local therapist and drug counselor, raking in the shekels hand over fist. Misery loves clinical sympathy. Understand, I'm not hollering foul play. You can't blame your life on anyone else. As soon as Rachel swiftly earned a master's in social work, she obtained certification and licenses in family and addiction counseling, then aced all the relevant national and state exams, whereupon bipolar heroin addicts and suicidal mortgage brokers began knocking down her door for help. She also led popular group sessions for adult children and alcoholics. The local grapevine informed me that Rachel excelled at marriage counseling, anger management, child battered women and transformational guidance, whatever the hell that is. She was on the board of Community Against Violence, aiding a wide range of disparate personalities who were dearly helped by her insightful empathy and wisdom. Strange as it seems, my second ex had a real gift. How could I compete with that? Not for ages had I spotted Rachel around town with another guy. That fact sort of gave me hope. Could she be suffering too? On one occasion, I bumped into her at Smith's, accompanied by a bearded young stud pushing her shopping cart. But he turned out to be her youngest gill netting son from Alaska, name of Willard. When Willard shook my hand, he almost broke every bone in it. <laughs> the other son, Maynard, was doing time in a quarter of jail for firing an AR-15 in a rival salmon boat infringing on his territory. Those lads were a couple of hotheads like their mom. <laughs> a little later the same year, the narrator has once again won the fishing contest, uh, I think for the 10th or 11th year in a row and he has a date for the banquet after the fishing contest, and her name is Adele Wiggins. Back home, Adele Wiggins and Bubba's date, Denise Lefkowitz, were already so tipsy they could barely stand up. Lamb chops percolated under the broiler flames. My heartbeat was quieter, yet I still felt kind of queasy being on, from being on the river. At the unveiling of our fish, Yuri and Bubba glared at my pile of lunkers, but what could they say except curses foiled again? When Denise sat on my lap to pose for a picture, she teased, marry me and let's run away to Morocco. I was holding crushed ice wrapped in a washcloth against my nose. He'd fallen and broken it. <laughs> Adele plopped out of my thighs and touched her lips against my ear, whispering a bit of impudent country music doggerel. Oh, what a man, what a man, what a man my man is. <laughs> <laughs> 
I posed for more portraits, proudly displaying the painted wooden trophy fish from Puerto Juan by Arte that we won each year. And after that, for the tenth year in a row, I printed my name and the date with a Sharpie pen on a big yellow tail, finishing my John Hancock with a feeble attempt at a flourish. My friend Yuri Grump, you fish like you write, it's all blind luck. I can't seem to help myself, I mumbled. I have a magic touch. However, that night in bed with Adele, I was miserable. Too much booze, too much everything. My head and my face ached, and Adele could not stop talking about Tibet, about her abusive stepdad, about her manic depressive stepsister, about her trip to Sri Lanka, about her Jungian analyst, about her monthly colonic enemas, about her, and about her desire to flee corporate America, go back to school, and earn a degree in anthropology. I finally lost my temper. Quote, at least you haven't been kidnapped and raped by extraterrestrials, and then went to a shrink who specializes in sexual abuse experienced during alien abductions. <laughs> Adele didn't think that was funny. <laughs> she lay beside me buzzing with malignant electricity while I breathed stertorously through my swollen beak. When I finally apologized for being such an insensitive oaf, she said, you three guys are so puerile. It's only for one day a year, I reasoned. That's one day too many for my taste, she replied. But then she caught me entirely off guard by saying plaintively, at least stop being so hateful. Make love with me like you almost mean it, okay? I'm not a nobody. Let's pretend for a minute that we're real people instead of cartoon characters. That was my desire exactly. So we kissed each other and embraced, making love with amiable consideration, and then we fell asleep in each other's arms, or rather, Adele conked out right away. I found it impossible to nod off, because Rachel still occupied my mind. I couldn't keep her at bay. Scrambled thoughts about her tormented me. For example, if I challenged her about some issue, her eyes would begin to glitter and she'd smile like a serial killer ready to pass. I feared that look even as it gave me a hard on. When we played Scrabble occasionally at night after dinner, she would remain a paragon of even-keeled attentiveness unless I had built an insurmountable lead as we ran out of wooden letters, at which point she'd casually poke the Scrabble board off our table, saying, whoops. <laughs> that was a signal for me to forget the score and attack her, go crazy flailing away on the rug, then shower together before falling exhausted into bed. Even then, I dream about Rachel, always Rachel, high-octane Rachel with her explosive imagination, fiery temper and contagious laughter. Rachel derisively ordered me to fuck her faster, harder, longer, better, crazier. Then suddenly she rolled away from me and jumped off the bed and threw up her arms hollering, what's the matter with you? Why are you so intractable? I love you, I cried out in my dream. Your love is the enemy of my freedom, she answered. <laughs> Autumn of 1996. The narrator is now 56 years old. Me, I had celebrated my 56th birthday two months earlier at the end of July, and I could display a scar from my throat to my belly button to prove it. Don't ask, I'll tell. Although this is embarrassing, I may as well fess up. I had already been remarried and re-divorced for the third time in my life since our 1992 Big Arsenic Fishing Contest. Sounds loopy? It's true. Who did I marry? Three guesses, the first two don't count. That's right. Rachel and I were drawn back together like Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, like the Anne Rivera and Frida Kahlo, like the Dodgers and the cursed Yankees long ago during their 1950s World Series clashes. Suddenly, she and I had collided again, and we couldn't keep our mitts off of each other. It started this way. I phoned her office to make an appointment for counseling. <laughs> she asked, what's the problem? I said, I'm depressed. I can't get motivated. I'm lethargic. I'm drinking too much. I'm in a tailspin. I need help. You and everyone else, she retorted coldly. See a shrink, get some Prozac. I need help from you, I wheedled. 
Rachel harumphed. You're out of your mind. I'm a professional. I'm wise to you. I pleaded. But you're the only person who understands me. Yes, that's true. Unfortunately, she agreed. And for that reason, I wouldn't touch you in my office with a ten-foot pole. I assured her I won't break any of your precious client therapist rules. She pointed out the fact that we're even having this phone conversation is compromising my client therapist rules. Then, who knows why? Her demons, my demons, ghastly serendipity, but she made an appointment with me. We had not spoken intimately for several years, yet five minutes into our session we began groping each other against her desk, and 20 minutes later we finished our unexpected collision in a noisy clatter of rapturous exclamations while Grandpa grappling on the office shag rug, thus breaking all her rules. You son of a bitch, she hissed. I missed you terribly, I cried. You don't deserve me, she snarled. I can't live without you, I groaned. Okay, Rachel said, abruptly as calm as the eye of a hurricane. But I don't want to live together. You crowd me and you're out. I need my own space. Me too, I echoed euphorically, proving that human emotional complexities and libidos are unfathomable. Question, how can it be that I had mysteriously cajoled what I wanted from this upscale, morally committed, rational, responsible, respectable, and even-keeled feminist icon? Answer, you can't tell a person by their public persona. <laughs> a week later, we completed our blood test, purchased the marriage certificate, and said, I do before a magistrate judge. It was just her, me, the judge, his doddering secretary who'd been with him for three decades. We had conscripted two witnesses from the lobby, the chubby guard who checked everybody through a metal detector, and an off-duty cop waiting to bail out his ex-son-in-law, jailed for failure to pay eight months of back child support. <laughs> Rachel had dressed up for the occasion in jogger Nikes and ankle socks, aluminum-colored exercise shorts, and a t-shirt with a Smokey Bear logo. We planned to go running afterwards. The judge said, Ma'am, could you please remove your gun? Rachel had woven her blonde hair into a long braid, and she had a good tan. I could picture her as one of the players on America's World Cup women's soccer team, healthy, athletic, and with the sharply alert eyes of a peregrine falcon. You had to keep really close watch on Rachel to surprise her looking drowsy, usually only around the time of her period, which was ending with menopause, or after sex. Otherwise, she appeared ten years younger and ferociously alive and arresting, like a maid who could have passed for Joan of Arc centuries ago, intimidating, regal, sensual, and somewhere in there, part of her great seductive charm, alluringly childlike. Shirley Temple meets Jacqueline Bissett. Rachel was always catching me off guard, that being part of her shtick. I never knew when we woke up together if she'd nestle snugly against me needing sex or hop out of bed, grab a cup of coffee and a glazed donut and be out of the kitchen door before I even realized that her feet had hit the floor. Over the next three years, our frenzied intellectual brawling led to emotional exhaustion, extreme jealousy, finally preordained betrayal, and down we twirled again spectacularly in flames. During that historical epic, I almost died of endocarditis, then I segued into congestive heart failure. I open heart surgery, they stitched an annuloplasty ring in my mitral valve, and next, for good measure, I underwent a double hernia operation and got divorced once more. <laughs> Never again, Rachel and I pledged in unison to each other as the divorce papers were being signed and we sealed our vows with a final spasm of carl carnal excess. At least this time around, no houses and very little money changed hands. What is it with you and women, my friend Yuri asked. I am hopelessly in love with her, I protested. You know that. I can't erase her off my mind. I'm obsessed by her imagination, her emotional fervor, her energy, her intellectual dexterity. The sex with her is like a wonderful car crash that never ends. The vehicle just rolls over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Down to 
Jesus, you're a lost cause, my friend. An emotionally arrested person, just like your literature, the epitome of gauche. When will you learn that infatuation is not intimacy, even if it lasts for a decade? You have to travel beyond the need for perpetual thrill. You must calm down and prepare for the long haul. Love is not a hundred yard dash. It's a marathon. Relationships are hard work. Sex is not all it's cracked up to be. Read Portnoy's complaint. Or maybe even take the plunge and plow through Anna Karenina. It wouldn't hurt you to tackle Flaubert either. Or maybe sink your teeth into Hedda Gobbler or Jane Austen. Women are way more than Dolly Parton and Jane Mansfield. Did you ever read Strindberg or the Kreutzer Sonata? You might even open a novel by Edith Wharton or take a break from the paucity of your intellectual range and crack a book by Hegel, try some of his dialectical laws on for size, then push on to Engels and Marx with their materialistic view of history which you claim to espouse, even though you never read Das Kapital or The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. Bottom line, you're a shallow dill an amateur Lothario, you even write pop fiction like a dilettante with little or no emotional depth. You describe the surface of things with a fancy schmancy vocabulary, but you never get underneath. I pity your offspring, their genetic roots. Thank you, I reply. <laughs> Autumn now of 2000, the narrator is 60 years old. His friend Yuri has died a couple of years earlier, but Bubba Baxter's still in the contest. I blew Bubba out of the water in 2000, same old, same old. He never had a chance. Blindfolded, locked in arrhythmia, gasping from asthma among the boulders, I could still rise to the occasion and crush him in our fishing contest. Me and Stephen Hawking. Bye bye, Bubba. <laughs> Off to a black hole with you. And we had the official unveiling of trout in my kitchen, witnessed breathlessly by Bubba's new big arsenic babe, Maggie Benoit, and my old girlfriend and twice ex wife, Rachel Ivory. Bubba produced only three modest trout specimens, which I countered to for tat. Did I say Rachel Ivory? Perhaps that's no surprise. As plain as day, we were wedded to each other by an emotional golem that reason could not explain. I was besotted by the terror of loving her, by the chaos and exaltation of our twisted ardor which needed to be reignited every handful of years. Beyond our mutual physical attraction resided a deep and obviously irresistible affinity that we held for each other's bizarre magnetism, which kept goading us onto the battlefield, strewn with corpses from our previous engagements. <laughs> Excuse the excessive verbiage, but you should understand that both of us were fascinated by the amorous butchery. Even though Rachel was far and away the most level-headed and compassionate transformational therapist practicing in our town, and even though I repeatedly had been lauded for my literary accomplishments as if I were a grown-up and masterful explainer of life's confusing and often tragic concatenations, behind closed doors, Rachel and I were like a couple of suicide bombers running pell-mell toward each other. <laughs> If you haven't been there, don't knock it. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> My older daughter, Stephanie, said, Dad, you're like a moth that keeps flying into the candle. My younger daughter, Naomi, said, Pop, you're like a prize 4-H cow that just wants to become hamburgers. <laughs> After Bubba's three trout specimens, I pulled from my droopy burlap bag a 16-inch rainbow and a 17-inch or two. However, I wasn't done. Drum rolls, por favor, my final fish tipped the scales at three pounds and 20 inches of fat brown trout gleaming golden along his lower flanks. And I had won our fishing contest once again 17 years in a row. <laughs> Bubba poured us another round of champagne and we all drank oodles of bubbly and recounted tales from when our dear friend Yuri had been alive. 
Toward midnight after Bubba and Maggie Benoit departed my house, I could not produce an erection for Rachel. Brushing off my apologies, she hugged me reassuringly. What are you worried about, darling? Just take a Viagra. I took a Viagra. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel whispered into my ear, I love you. She wrapped her arms around my torso, holding me in a reassuring embrace, which may have been the first occasion in our tarnished history of attachments and detachments that her clinch did not feel erotically stimulating, but rather protective. And through my champagne and fog, I took note. I woke up. I love you back, I replied on tenterhooks, yet hastily I added, please don't take it the wrong way. <laughs> don't panic, she said, I'm not afraid of you anymore. Afraid of me? I pretended to be shocked. I'm terrified of anyone who kidnaps the irrational part of me that sabotaged my need to be myself, she explained, smiling. You know that. It's my marital tradition. Something happened. I'm not saying a flying saucer swooped down and hovered above the head down, its open cargo doors illuminating us with a beatific light. Yet maybe this night was the first time I'd halfway fallen in love with Rachel. Cliché alert. You can be obsessed with somebody and never actually treat them like a human being. And the lover held on too high a pestival that pedestal is a calamity waiting to happen. That said, from here on, it would be a new ball game between Rachel and yours, Julie, and difficult for us to push each other away as we had before. A eureka moment had occurred, developing casually, out of frame, in secret, unbeknownst to us. But when our tectonic plates shifted a few inches, the world changed. Although we barely felt the shiver of realignment, it would be lasting. <clears throat> this is an unconscious acclamation, a bit of physical and emotional magic that nobody quite understands and for which everyone yearns. Subsequently, Rachel and I continued to void sharing a dwelling because that would have been stretching the point. Instead, we carried on our separate lives, meeting once a week to break bread, see a movie, hike in the high mountains, or to indulge ourselves between the sheets. You could say we managed to strike a happy medium at last by avoiding, like the plague, the sort of familiarity that breeds contempt. Some folks might consider such an arrange arrangement quirky, but hey, to each his own, and the devil take the hindmost. <laughs> participate in the Somos program, and Bill and I will sign books if any of you would like to purchase uh, books now. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill. Two consummate writers, environmentalists, and human beings. John has given unselfishly to support Somos every summer, and this is no exception. So please show your appreciation to the both of them by buying books. Thank you.